repair, reinvestment, equity, justice, speaking our language. Um, now we're getting to the meat of it. We're about to get into the sessions, the panels. Uh, our first session is on advocacy and government relations. Uh, Jean Sullivan is my co-host, co-moderator. Uh, I call her Jeannie. Uh, Jeannie, if you would come up, please, while I introduce you. Uh, Jeannie is a longtime venture capital investor, and she is all in on cannabis and has been in the industry since 2014 when New York passed the Compassionate Care Act and was involved with one of the first licenses in New York, a wealth of knowledge right here. She is Chief Investment Officer for Arcview Ventures and is active as an advisor, investor, and thought leader and speaker in the industry. I'm going to turn it over to you, Jean. Hey, thank you, Cedric, and hi, everyone. I am Jean Sullivan and so pleased to be here today. Great turnout, beautiful weather, right? So, first of all, I do want to thank Chairman Tremaine Wright. Thank you so much for your words, your wisdom, your ideas. You can see we've got a powerhouse at the top just aiming to make things happen. Yes, are things slower than we'd like? Sure, but we are making progress. So that's pretty exciting. And to wonderful Sinead Bullock, who I've had the pleasure of meeting, what a lovely ceremony. And we can hardly wait for your terrific cannabis operations to uh, get open here. So I am so proud that we have the opening session here. I welcome to the stage my wonderful team. Come on up, Cheryl. And Lou and Matt. So thank you. This is good. Now, you might think this sounds boring, right? Policy, government relations, advocacy. No way. These are the smart people who are making this happen behind the scenes. It's important. It's critical. Cheryl, introduce yourself. Who thank are you. you? What are you working on? All right. Thank you, Jean. Um, Thank you all for coming out in the name of cannabis, bringing this group together in the Hamptons of New York. My name is Cheryl Murray Powell Esquire. I'm a cannabis agricultural and dietary supplement attorney. I am also the chief operating officer for the Justice Foundation. So we are a nonprofit focused on helping legacy operators get into the cannabis space. Um, when we talk about legacy operators, those are the people who were a part of the existing market, some people like to say the illicit market, the uninformed like to say the black market, but those are the people that you would call as your guy who got you cannabis before <laughs> uh, legalization. And um, these are also people who protected the genetics um, of cannabis over decades of prohibition, and they also got a lot of cannabis to patients. Beyond that, I'm also on the executive committee for ASTM International's D37 Committee on Cannabis. I'm on the Bureau of Standards for Cannabis for the Country of Jamaica, and I'm also was a former um, Director of Federal Affairs for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and I am the current Executive Director for the African American Farmers Association. So nice to be here. Thank you so much, Jean. You are a busy woman, Cheryl. Amazing, and we're gonna circle back to that Justice Foundation work. Lou, I'm going to say your name right, Magazu, right? Yes. So look, New Jersey beat out New York on getting to that adult use legislation. So I've been in so many groups where everyone cheers for New Jersey, and it's the first time ever. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so tell us about your background. What are you working on? Tell us about your work with Governor Phil Murray. And there goes my leer, so hold on for a minute. All right, Lou, talk to us. I think, Benjamin, I think Benjamin Franklin said that New Jersey was the valley of humility uh, in between two mountains of conceit. Whether that's true or not, <laughs> New Jersey uh, is uh, probably a lot less humble. Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, just by way of background, I've been an attorney for 40 years. I served as chairman of the Cumberland County Board of Commissioners. I uh, served on that board for 15 years. I was chairman of the National Democratic County Officials. I was president of the New Jersey Association of Counties and on the board of directors of the National Association of Counties. Happily retired from all of that. I spent 15 years as a municipal attorney, and uh, since about 2000, uh, I have uh, done about $4 billion of transactional work. In 2017 and 18, decided to look at this space. Uh, as I like to say, uh, my opportunity to serve as a cannabis attorney made the four years of college finally all worthwhile. Uh, the, uh, my first client, and uh, it was the only time, and I don't say this disrespectfully to MSOs, 
but I, was the I had the opportunity to be counsel for Columbia Care in one of the uh, licenses in the first round, uh, the most recent round in 2018. 2019, uh, represented LiveWell, and they ultimately decided not to apply in Jersey. And last round, and I moved and pivoted my, my practice to social equity applicants, and I was delighted to represent three successful uh, applicants, uh, two in cultivation, one in manufacturing, and look forward to the opportunity uh, to bring much of uh, the things I've learned in other parts of my practice. I was counsel to cellular telephone industry 20 years, 25 years ago. A lot of those same similarities in terms of the entrepreneurial spirit and the risks, and look forward to uh, uh, talking about uh, those and, uh, and other things that I've learned and perhaps opportunities in New Jersey. Thank you. Dean. Thank you, Lou. It shows that experience counts. Matt, thank you for being here. Tell us about what's going on in Albany and what you're working on, some of the policy uh, issues that have your attention. First, give us your background. I hope. Hello. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Gene. Uh, thank you, Gary, for putting this on, and Chairwoman Wright for, for coming down here. And thank you to the panelists, Cheryl and Lou. Um, my name is Matt Leonardo. I work at Him and Straub. Uh, we're uh, one of the oldest law firms in Albany, New York. We're the oldest government affairs practice uh, in, in the state. Um, we, uh, we work in both the regulatory space and the legislative space. And that unique perspective uh, allows us to take uh, client uh, priorities from the regulatory environment to the legislative environment. As we're all aware, there's not a significant amount of regulatory uh, action um, that impacts people beyond the justice-involved individuals right now. Um, that being said, uh, the, the cannabis landscape is very interesting right now. Um, of course, we still have Senator Liz Krueger and Majority Leader Crystal People Stokes, who were the sponsors of the MRTA. However, we've lost a lot of allies. Uh, Chairwoman Wright used to be Assemblywoman Wright. Um, she was a strong proponent in the Assembly for legalization. Senator uh, Diane Savino, uh, also known as the godmother of cannabis, was uh, just recently retired. And so we need more champions and allies in the legislature. And so when I think of what's going on, I think of the short term, the midterm, and the long term. In the short term, I could see uh, some movement towards including LGBT, uh, Q populations and the definition of equity. Uh, it's a big priority of the legislature. The history of the LGBTQ community has been more inclusion in state programs. Um, in the midterm, um, you know, I think that the integration of the legacy operators into the, uh, the legitimate market, so to speak, um, is, is a big deal. We have the card application, which we'll discuss later, um, and the $200 million equity fund, which is a great first step whether that support continues is a big issue uh, for the legislatures or legislators. Um, and in long term, I think what we see right now is there's a lot of capital on the sidelines. Um, and that's really because the MRTA, by its uh, uh, terms, limits le retail licenses to three licenses. And so I think you'll see a movement from both operators and investors to try to loosen the restrictions of maybe 5 to 10 percent. Uh, of ownership that may not count as a direct or indirect interest in the license. Well, that's interesting. Now, in case you miss this in the MRTA, which was a statute, and as you all know and heard from uh, Chairman Tremaine, we're waiting for the regulations to really lay out a more detail, but women are considered social equity in the state of New York. We love that. You know what else New York did? We're the only one that said in the statute that social consumption lounges are important licenses. Yes, important. I see Vlad in great agreement. And also, uh, the fact that uh, Home Grow is here, and hey, Lou, Home Grow hasn't made it into the New Jersey regs. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let's go back to Cheryl. Cheryl, tell us more what your work is all about with the Justice Foundation. What's the big vision, and can you pull it off? Talk to yes, us. Yes, thank you so much for, for that opportunity to share our work. So at the Justice Foundation, uh, as I mentioned, we work with legacy operators. We have a full service center in Harlem, New York, where we have computers. So we have computer workstations for legacy operators to come in and complete their applications. Many were planning to do it on their actual cell phones because that's all they have access to. Um, we provide guidance, volunteer attorney support, volunteer uh, uh, accounting support, and other services. Um, we re do contract review, which is really important for legacy and social equity operators to make sure that they understand these commitments that are being made from whether they're funders or 
other participants in their license application or in, in their operations. Um, we were involved with the forming of the Unified Legacy Operators Council. Unlock, their website is unlock without the K now.org or com. And this is an autonomous group of legacy operators that are fellowshipping, they're determining their own destiny, and they're involved with um, providing public comments when that opportunity is available. So I serve as an advisor, Steve D'Angelo also serves as an advisor. Um, for Unlock, Inc. Um, Post-licensure, we also continue that level of support for our legacy operators. So any given day in Harlem, I will have one or two legacy operators come into my office and, and identify how they want to engage with the industry. Some are only interested in ancillary opportunities. I have one gentleman who um, is only interested in creating marketing materials. So he, there's an iPad that we have set aside for him. He requested a stylus. We purchased the stylus. There may be, um, he may need gas money to get to the office. We provide gas money, we provide Metro cards. So there's a range of services that we offer. Um, one thing I do wanna highlight is we are extremely supportive of community organizations that have supported legacy prior to um, our, our creation. So we provide every month community organization grants to organizations such as the Hood Incubator, um, Unlock, Unlock Inc., um, CanAware, and other organizations that are already doing the work. So we are supplementary to the existing industry. We are not competitive, and we gather resources for them to be immediately distributed to our legacy community. You know, what you just said begs us. The whole reason of you as our wonderful audience sitting here is to connect with the people on the stage. So Cheryl, I would say I know plenty of people who want to meet some of these legacy people who may wish to get a license, how do we do that even? So with our work at Justice Foundation, we protect the identity of legacy operators. Um, for that to happen, a legacy operator would have to, be in, have to indicate that they're interested in um, expanding their team or they're interested in accessing capital. And if it's a capital conversation, we would want to review proof of funds prior to any introduction. Um, again, legacy operators uh, move in their autonomy, so we don't make those decisions for meet and greets for the legacy operator. It's based on their own determination. We facilitate the discussions, and we review any contracts that they may engage in. How do, how do we do business with you? Yes, yeah, so, so there our... There goes our Learjet again. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, in order to get involved with uh, the Justice Foundation and our work, please access our website, which is www.justice.foundation. We are also accepting donations, and those again, those donations are distributed to our legacy community for, for resources. Um, you can go to legacy2legal.com. So legacy number 2 legalcom in order to donate to the Justice Foundation and support our work. Thank, thank you for thank that you opportunity. So, thank you so much. All right, Lou, you've been working hard in New Jersey. You have a formidable background. First, give us a quick overview. Can Is there opportunity still to even get a license in, in Jersey? In Jersey? Yeah, there's, there, there's tremendous, there's, there's uh, more opportunity, there's tremendous opportunity to get licenses. Just to give a little sense of, uh, of the Jersey um, paradigm, which as I understand it, I've learned a lot from the panel in preparation, how we're different from New York. Uh, Jersey has been up and running, uh, started out actually years ago uh, on the medical side, uh, and then had the opportunity uh, first for the medicals to be fully vertical through automatic uh, uh, conversions. And then with legislation that was passed, really had a commitment uh, to social equity. Now, it's not a predicate in New Jersey, but you get extra points. You get extra points if you're a legacy, specifically if uh, you've had uh, two uh, disorderly offenses in cannabis or one felony and can show rehabilitation. You have to have both parts, of, both prongs of that. Uh, or if you're a WMBE or if you're a disabled veteran. So there are things that give you extra points in the uh, application process. Uh, there were uh, up to 37 and actually more uh, what they call conditional licenses that were applied uh, for cultivation. There were also manufacturing licenses that were approved uh, back in, in the fall. Uh, they are now being awarded, uh, now, now being converted, I should say. Uh, and additionally, there were manufacturing, and now there's going to be retail licenses that uh, were the open, it was opened, uh, I think, in March, and there's going to be a significant amount of retail licenses throughout the state. Do we they, know the number yet? 
there's not, a, unlike the uh, cultivation, which had a fixed number, there's not a fixed number as to retail. However, wait. Every time a train goes over, a plane goes over, it's another time that Dallas will be losing a football game this coming year. In any <laughs> event, that's how I, I resolve it. Uh, the question is how many. As to retail, and this is important, the municipalities have great discretion. And only 150 of the 565 municipalities in the state have opted in for some type of cannabis. Even fewer have opted in as to retail. So the very first piece is you have to get the, the municipal approval. And then you have to go through a fairly rigorous process, but a pretty fair process, uh, to get uh, CRC approval. Uh, that is a, a rolling type process, unless you're called with a conditional application, uh, which is some of those things I referenced earlier, you go to the very top of the line. The interesting thing about the Jersey regs, it's very much like an open book exam. They tell you what the points are that you're going to get. The one, the one deficiency, and perhaps it does not exist in New York, is that you can get a social equity uh, a conditional license, but you don't have funding. You don't have experience. You don't have SOPs. What I've done in my practice, and I really enjoy this, is bringing together people that clearly are going to get the licenses with folks who are not MSOs but have had success elsewhere that want to come into New Jersey uh, at one of the tiers and one of the levels. And I think it presents an opportunity to, to, to bring both, uh, both groups together. No, that's interesting. Now, something that's always uh, interesting to know is what's the tone What's Governor Murphy saying? What are the people, entrepreneurs, investors saying? Are they happy with things? Well, never. nobody's ever fully happy. Now, in full disclosure, you know, I, I'm a big supporter of the governor. I was chairman of his inaugural, so I, I have a bias. But I think he comes out of it with a real uh, commitment to social justice. He also does have the finance background in, in, in Goldman Sachs. Interestingly, it was not passed by the legislature. It was stuck in the legislature, and they, made a, and they put it as a referendum, 75% approval rating, and then they negotiated. The issue has been, and it's is everywhere, how do you protect the legacy folks? How do you protect the people who deserve in social equity, and at the same time allow them to succeed and not set, some, set them up to failure? Uh, they also learned a lot from the first two rounds that were administered by the health department as opposed to the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, and they learned a lot from their mistakes. I would say that there's a general sense of improvement, but the, th the way that I identify success is in the last round, there was not one piece of litigation challenging the awards as opposed to the prior two rounds. That suggests to me that there's at least some level of success to the extent that no one's going to challenge it in court. You know, we want these states as they each come on to learn from each other. Matt, let's go to you. Talk um, can I just add one course. more thing in um, with regards to social equity and uh, our legacy operators and connecting them with people with skills. I think that's so critically important, but I, I want to make sure that people don't have the misconception that because someone's social equity or their legacy that they lack business acumen. Um, that's really something that our Unlock guys that we work with and other groups, again, we're, we're an international organization. They, they don't want to be misunderstood that they don't have business experience. Some of these legacy operations are more profitable than legal cannabis businesses right now. In fact, a lot of them are. Um, so it's really important that we give the dignity and respect to the legacy operators for what they have been able to build and, and the type of businesses that they have been able to successfully run um, for multiple years. But I, I do think there's um, definitely a, a need for connection between uh, traditional business outside of cannabis um, people who've been successful in the cannabis industry, uh, legal cannabis industry, and also the, our legacy operators And if as I well. could just respond to that, actually, you're exactly on point. In every instance where we've put these introductions, these folks were legacy folks from other states as opposed to, frankly, MSO. So, that's, so they've had that history and that texture of understanding how the people in Jersey are tr starting now because they were them five or six that's or eight beautiful. years ago. So, Matt, you heard from Chairman Tremaine about justice involved and they're gonna have first access to dispensary licenses. Certainly you know that Cheryl spends her life lose doing his work with social equity. Talk to us and demystify what's going on in New York. Like what is it? You have to have what's called a 221 conviction. What the heck even is that? What are some of the criteria you have to have to play? And you know, t talk to us about the program. Sure, so you, you heard Lou describe the New Jersey program. Um, New York is just fundamentally different. Um, and I think New York and the Office of Cannabis Management have learned from other jurisdictions' mistakes 
Um, other jurisdictions have let equity applicants in or advantage them in some way. New York has put them in the front of the line. And there's really two ways that that has happened. First, the Office of Cannabis Management has established the Conditional Adult Use Retail Dispensary Program, which we call the CARD program. And what the CARD program is, um, it, it allows a person to apply for a conditional retail license. Um, you need to have been uh, have a charge under Article 221 of the penal law, which is really sale or possession of cannabis. Um, and second, you need to have had uh, a 10% interest in a business uh, that had a net profit for two years in, during which you had the interest. Um, so that's the eligibility criteria. Second half of that is the dormitory authority has uh, contracted with the commercial real estate group to build out about 150 sites across 14 regions. Um, and what the conditional program, it fits hand in glove with the card program. So the card program, once you're eligible, you apply. If you get a license, you'll be able to have a built out uh, location by DASNY. DASNY's your landlord. You'll enter into a lease with DASNY um, and, and uh, you'll have point of sale, your capital done, and you'll be able to go into what is basically a state franchise for retail dispensaries. I'd say in the second half of the support for equity applicants, this past budget, Governor Hochul signed a $200 million equity loan fund. So you know, as everybody knows, there's the capital build out, but you really need operating cash. You need, you need working capital to be able to be a successful business uh, um, person. So this $200 million equity fund, you know, if you look at the, the 150 so, uh, or so uh, retail sites that are gonna be through DASNY, it's about a million dollars per equity applicant. So the state has given a lot of support. Um, again, I think the issue going forward is, will that support continue? That's pretty exciting, and I think really forward thinking. Now, if you are a person in license pursuit, you also better understand what a peace agreement is. Tell us what that is and what you have to know about the labor uh, uh, agreements that you, you have to understand. Tell us that. Sure. So under the MRTA, um, there, there's a requirement that you have a labor peace agreement. And, and it's, it, it seems daunting, um, but it's really not. The, the only union that we are aware of that qualifies is the RDWSU, Local 338. Um, what you have to do is basically have a form contract with them that says you will not oppose unionization. Um, the union will agree to do specific things uh, and not interfere with specific operations, uh, but really, it, it's, it seems a lot more daunting than it is. It's, it's, a little more, it's a little more complicated in New Jersey because the uh, labor peace agreements, and I'm very supportive of them, are both for the construction trade component, um, which would be the AFL-CIO building trades, uh, and UFCW with respect to the, uh, to the employees. Uh, it is, there is an exemption, and I'm not going to get into the weeds, but there's something that's called a micro license, which has 10 or fewer employees uh, and, and a certain amount of square foot and, and, uh, and flower, uh, and canopy rather. Uh, they do not have to have unions. Uh, however, anything larger than the micros do have to have the union peace agreement. But they're very simple, and what I've tried to do is work them out in advance of the application process, even during conditional applications. Yeah, and to be clear, in New York, it's just on the employee side. It's not on the construction. Yeah, I, I sense that, yeah. So you can see the behind-the-scenes work, the in-front-of-the-scenes work, and the people who know what the heck they're doing. You are important to know, each of you, and I thank you for this. How about closing with a few words of wisdom? Cheryl, what words of wisdom might you have for this? Yeah, I think um, where I want to close is really uh, talking about um, social justice, social equity, and social responsibility. I call them the three pillars of, of excellence. So... You know, there should not be any person who is arrested at this point in history for marijuana, for cannabis, however you want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, refer to it as. It's really unconscionable that we're still seeing arrests. We're still, still seeing celebrity arrests. So um, let's not stop the work there as we talk about the business opportunity. Um, social equity, uh, we need to create an equitable space for all types of people to participate. Um, whether it's uh, based on ethnicity, whether it's um, faith-based. Um, I think there's opportunity for us to look at sacramental use um, with regards to cannabis as well. Um, so let's make sure that it, we're building an inclusive industry. And I like what I'm seeing at this conference. Gary's gonna done a great job of creating an inclusive conference. So we'd like to see that cascade. And then social responsibility, 
means that the people who are um, commercializing cannabis or making money from this industry do have a responsibility to give back uh, to the communities that they operate in. So um, community reinvestment is really important. Um, m many regulations in, in New York uh, consists of you know, some type of community redevelopment um, provisions. We need to keep that going. We need to really hold accountable um, our, our leadership as far as how those funds from taxation are being used to, um, to support the communities where we are operating our cannabis businesses in. And also my last point, when it comes to taxation, we need to be reasonable. Um, it will be a deterrent for our cannabis, legacy cannabis industry for folks to get into the legal industry if we really don't have responsible taxation, which isn't a deterrent or, or too high for our uh, legacy guys to get involved and still feed their families, um, become profitable, start working towards their retirement plans like the rest of us have. So let's really address taxation and reasonable, responsible taxation as a state. You know, Cheryl, you moved here from Florida to New York to do this hard work. Thank you Thank for you that so effort. Much. Thank you for being here and this hard work. And I know your partner, Steve D'Angelo, just is fighting for to, to make a change. And, yes. and make a difference. So that's exciting. Absolutely. It's Lou, an honor to share yeah. a stage with you, Gene. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lou? Well, Gene, first of all, thank you for doing such a terrific job. Gary, thank you for the opportunity. I really want to associate myself with the entirety of your last remarks. Uh, I thought yeah. they were right on point. Somebody should copy them and distribute them to every yes. legislature in the, in, in the country. Yes. Uh, I come from the position, and uh, as a former elected official and also representing corporate side and now the social equity side, that they do not have to be inherently in conflict. In fact, quite the contrary, there's an opportunity, particularly if you're bringing folks in that started from social equity, that started literally from the, the small grow or from the small shop uh, in some other state and, and, and now wants to come to this part of the world. New Jersey uh, does have a little bit of a leg up, I think maybe a year, a year and a half uh, uh, experience, but we're learning from our experience. Uh, the other thing that we're doing in New Jersey uh, that I'm very proud of is I'm working with other attorneys. And I've basically said to all the attorneys who are making money on this, all right, we're making money. Let's give back in this way. We're, we're representing, we're, and I'm working with the, uh, US, the, the New Jersey Supreme Court, we're going to represent for free anyone who has an opportunity for an expungement. Because although there's an expungement lane in New Jersey, frankly, people are afraid to go to lawyers, they can't afford to go to lawyers, or they think that uh, it's a trap, perhaps. So one of the things that we're working on is to find all those folks out there, regardless of whether they want to get into the industry, who are carrying the stigma of that conviction and make it go away so that they have an opportunity to go move forward. And I think that although it's a great opportunity to see businesses grow, and I really enjoyed seeing folks who have a dream turning into a business, I think it's an equal opportunity to literally bring the assets of the business to, to directly have a positive effect uh, on social justice and social equity in a way that doesn't always exist in society. Typically, those things are, are, are in competition or in conflict. Here, I think there's a way to make them uh, work together. And thank you for this opportunity, Thank Gene. you, Lou. Matt? Thank you, Gene. And, uh, you know, I think I agree with both your remarks on equity, but I want to take a, a little different perspective um, just from the legislative side. Uh, you know, this is an emerging industry. Uh, the division of budget uh, estimated it was a $3 billion industry um, when, uh, when we went through legalization to MRTA. To put that in perspective, the healthcare industry in New York State is $300 billion, all right? So we're an industry fighting other industries for scarce resources, okay? The legislature each year considers 40,000 bills, okay? The New York State legislature introduces and considers 40,000 bills. We need champions and allies in the legislature. We need to be active and advocates for our own cause. So for me, I would say, as I would say to any industry, it's very important to join together, to speak with one voice, to create associations, um, to all row in the same direction. Because at the end of the day, if we don't stand together, then we'll fall apart. Love it, thank you. If you've heard me speak, you've heard me say this, I say it to you. If you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Let's go together and make change and make this happen. Thank you, Cheryl, Lou, Thank Matt. Thank you so much.